they have prepared a short presentation to, to help guide the discussion that they will be sharing with everyone. Um, and we'll dive into that in a moment. Uh, this is one of the first uh, webinars that we have held uh, focused on the telecom industry. So it's really great to be able to, to bring all of you together to listen to our, to our panelists today. So first, uh, first up, uh, we have Sam McGuire, who is the Vice President of Red Mountain Scientific. Uh, in that role, Sam works with stakeholders across the wireless industry uh, to deploy uh, drone and image analyt analytics technologies in order to better help to assess and understand and manage the critical infrastructure in our nation. Uh, prior to Sam's time at Red Mountain Scientific, he actually spent about a year in the field um, actually being hands-on and, and climbing and conducting structural inspections on a, a couple hundred towers across the U.S. Uh, this hands-on field experience really allowed Sam to be able to join our Red Mountain Scientific um, and take on a critical role in helping to build their telecom product offerings from the ground up. Next, uh, we have Mark Foster joining us today. He is the Director of Quality at SBA Communications, uh, which some of you may know as one of the largest uh, telecom operators in the, in this, in the state. Uh, he collaborates in this role with different vendors, employees, executives, and customers to ensure that uh, the highest level of quality uh, occurs on every single SBA site. Mark has over 25, of ex 25 years of experience in quality and risk management for manufacturers, network providers, and also service companies. In his role, Mark oversees SBA's quality department, UAS program, uh, and also the services installation portion of their Tower University. Next, we also have uh, Steve Rosler, who is the president at Vertical Limit. Uh, as the president of Vertical Limit, uh, Steve has led uh, the, his company to be an early adopter of UAS technologies to improve the data collection and processing, as well as uh, to improve the safety and operational efficiencies of crews in the field. Uh, in addition to the wireless industry, Steve has led high performing operations and cultural change management programs. Um, in both the airline and transportation industries uh, in a, a number of nationally recognized companies over the past 30 years. So as you can see, we have uh, a wonderful uh, panel of subject matter experts here from different uh, aspects of the telecom industry to talk to everyone today. So gentlemen, thank you all for making the time to join us today. I will now hand it over to each of you to go more in depth about your respective companies and your role in the company, um, as well as the broader telecom industry. So let's uh, start with uh, Sam. Uh, thanks, Cynthia. And uh, good afternoon to everybody on the phone. As Cynthia mentioned, my name is Sam McGuire. Uh, and for the last three years, I've been uh, helping Red Mountain engage the telecom industry to uh, really understand what the use cases are going to be uh, for drone technology now and into the future. What we've concentrated on over those last few years has been the development of automated flight so that we can bring some consistency and repeatability to in-field workflows. And then also obviously uh, doing a better job understanding, organizing, and analyzing the data that comes off of these images. If you think back to uh, my days in the field, uh, the standard traditional workflows for uh, transferring, analyzing, and organizing image data was challenging back then. And now with drones incorporated into the workflows, uh, we have you know sometimes 10 times as many photos per site, which can get really challenging. So we've concentrated on that and helping folks uh, turn those into industry specific reports with the click of a button. Uh, in addition to Red Mountain, um, I'm also the chair of the Drones Ad Hoc Group at the Telecom Industry Association and an active member uh, with the Nate UAS Committee where we're exploring use cases for the technology, understanding what the future of this is gonna look like and uh, trying to drive this technology out in the field. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Mark, would you mind giving us a more in-depth introduction of SBA as well as your role there? Sure. Um, this is Mark Foster, Director of Quality at SBA. Um, we're a leading independent owner and operator of wireless communication infrastructure, including towers, buildings, rooftops, gas systems, and small cells. Um, we're located throughout the Americas and South Africa. Um, 
obviously listed on the NASDAQ and the, or the S&P 500. And we're also one of the top 20 real estate investment trusts uh, based on market capitalization. We started our UAS program in late 2013 with a single pilot and a single S900 drone. That's kind of an antique, I guess, in uh, today's standards of drones. But we then quickly expanded it throughout the quality department. Um, we really saw the value add to the company overall. Then we expanded to our operations division. And now we've expanded it internationally and uh, we're at around 100 pilots worldwide um, with people out flying and collecting data every single day. Wonderful, thank you, Mark. Uh, over to you, Steve. Hi, Steve. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. All right. Um, hi, my name is Steve Rossler. I'm the president of Vertical Limit. Uh, we are have been in the wireless industry since about 2002. We focus primarily, our history has been focused on primarily on construction and repair and modification and auditing services. In 2019, we joined the Qualtech Sister of Families uh, companies to expand our reach nat nationwide. We uh, historically had focused primarily across the Midwest, down through the South. Um, and with that uh, combination really gave us national reach we started utilizing and seeing the benefits of uh, the UAS platform starting in about 2017, as we started to see the capabilities and the price points make sense for being able to really gain efficiencies out in the field. Um, since then, we've uh, utilized it. We do thousands of inspections a year, and we've done north of 500 uh, tower audits and inspections with the utilizing drone technology. So. Thanks, I'm uh, excited to be a part of the panel. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I think what we wanna do next, uh, Sam, if you don't mind, uh, it would be great if you could provide kind of a quick level set for all of our attendees today. I, I know that we have um, attendees who come from the telecom industry and then also some who are just sort of exploring and, and trying to learn a little bit more about this industry. Um, so if you could give us a, a industry walkthrough, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so, with this slide, I'll just cover some of the primary stakeholders. Obviously, this is a, a, a massive industry and there are other players than these, but when we look at the future of UAS, um, I think these are gonna be some of the prime beneficiaries of the technology. And uh, taking a step back, I didn't really get into the industry until about 2016. And before that, uh, it was largely invisible to me. You, you just assume that your phone's working based off something in the background. and from the first time you climb a tower, you just can't unsee them. And you can't unsee antennas uh, that are being deployed across infrastructure like billboards and water tanks and rooftops. Um, and, it, and to do that, we have these three primary stakeholders, um, field teams uh, like Vertical Limit that are out there. They're the boots on the ground helping us uh, maintain, enhance, and deploy that infrastructure. They're the guys who are doing the vast majority of the truck rolls and, and keeping the infrastructure working. Uh, you have the tower ownership groups, which is comprised of um, dozens, uh, but you know a, a handful of very large ones that own tens of thousands across the United States. Uh, they kind of act as the landlords in the industry, leasing out space to the carriers who are uh, deploying antennas, leveraging spectrum, and keeping our phones and mobile devices connected, allowing us to engage in webinars like today and everything else, streaming services, uh, phone calls, you name it. Um, so when we look at the folks that are gonna take UAS technology and really drive it into field, it's gonna be uh, these carriers um, kind of holding the torch. And with that, I, I'd actually like to hand it over to Mark real quick to take us through a little bit of the nuance around the different infrastructure types in the industry. Thanks, Sam. Uh, these are the four most common types of tower types that we deal with. Um, monopoles, obviously in urban environments, uh, they're smaller towers that can go from 
you know, 50 feet to 200 feet. Um, they're very common in areas like Los Angeles and places like that. Um, the lattice is a, you know, a larger cell support tower, two to 400 feet, um, typically used by telecom carriers. Um, it's, a, it's a mainstay in our industry. Then the guide towers, um, those are the ones that really start to get tall. They can go anywhere from 200 to 2,000 feet. They're used by television stations, radio broadcasting, paging, and also uh, telecom pr providers. We mainly see those in the uh, rural areas where we need to get up really tall and boom that signal out a long way. Um, and then with the stealth, we run into that a lot where a certain area wants to maintain an aesthetic quality for the area. That can be anything from a cell tower that looks like a pine tree to a palm tree, um, flag poles, church steeples, you name it, whatever the community demands uh, to fit into their certain aesthetic that they require. We'll make a cell tower, or build a cell tower that will fit into their neighborhoods and their environments and uh, meet their requirements. That's awesome. about all I got and, there. And Mark, would you mind touching on some of the small cell deployment that we'd see uh, maybe outside of these four? Yeah, sure. types? yeah, and we do go out and uh, attach carrier equipment to, you know, light poles, power poles, uh, street lights, billboards. You'll see them any place we can hang an antenna to fill in the gaps on a network. Um, we'll make agreements with whoever owns that particular um, billboard or, you know, power pole, power companies, and place that equipment there also. And then we also deploy um, in football stadiums, uh, concert venues, airports, anywhere there's going to be a high concentration of people that the, you know, typical sales out tower can't get enough equipment to cover. Um, we go in and deploy equipment in those areas too. Awesome. Um, and with that, just want to segue into the rest of the content with a disclaimer for anybody who is uh, not familiar with this infrastructure type or hasn't visited one of these sites. Um, it, this is categorized as critical infrastructure. I think that's been really obvious with everything happening with COVID-19 and uh, the importance of keeping this these systems up and running. With that, um, these are privately owned assets, oftentimes residing on private property and uh, because of that, there are very strict parameters around operating, uh, especially flying drones these days. So before you uh, are, you know, thinking through deploying, going out and doing these inspections, make sure that you've done all your due diligence and are uh, very aware of the requirements, depending on the stakeholders, landowners, anybody who uh, has a vested interest. And with that, uh, the, the team at SBA, as you can tell, has spearheaded a lot of these efforts, um, being one of the primary providers uh, of these towers and, and real estate management. And they've put together some really comprehensive pre and post flight checklists. Uh, here are a couple of examples and maybe Mark can walk us through that. Sure. Um, we created these policies and checklists because we really wanted to know you know, who was on our towers, when they were going to be on our towers. We wanted to make sure that they were following the proper safety checks. Um, we wanted to protect our customers and our assets at the same time. And then there's also um, FAA and environmental concerns um, with the flights. You know, just last week I received a NTP, which is a notice to proceed for um, a customer wanting to fly one of our towers. And we knew that there was actually nesting birds on that site. So we were able to turn them down and say, hey, you know, this site is shut down right now. We cannot go out and disturb the birds. Um, and we, we wanna make sure that, you know, the companies and the pilots that fly our prop property is, you know, they're insured, they're licensed, and they know what they're doing. So we created these procedures to, just to give them, you know, a second set of checks. You know, has everyone in the flight area been notified to vacate the area? Are the power lines and the overhead hazards been identified? We want to make sure everyone is doing their proper um, due diligence before going out and just flying on the tower. We want them to be aware of everything around them. We want them to have a plan if something goes wrong. So we got together and created this and made it a requirement to fly an SBA tower, not only these checklists, um, but the policy we have available on our website kind of walks you through 
what you need to do to become a vendor who's able to fly on our assets, what the insurance required requirements are, and what you need to do to be able to do that. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, just going back to that slide for a second, um, in case our audience is interested in um, looking into those pre and post flight checklists and some of the other associated policies that SBA holds to, um, we've gone ahead and dropped those links into the chat as well. So you're able to, uh, you know, check those links out there. So I'll, uh, this is Steve, and I'm going to hop in just a little bit here and talk about the workflow side. But before I do, you know, one of the main reasons that we are doing tower inspections or audits is really it's all about data collection. You know, what we're looking for is ensuring that those structures are safe from a structural perspective. They have all the proper safety equipment for uh, making sure when people are on the towers that they're safe and to ensure all the systems are operational. And so we need to get out there every once in a while at frequent intervals and take a look at the towers and make sure everything that we have and the way it was built is still in a in a an acceptable condition and able to be there safely and maintain weather and all other adverse conditions that come up. In addition, many times people like SBA or the clients that have their antennas on the sites want to upgrade or make performance changes. So we're up there to collect data on measurements of the type of equipment that's on the site today, how much uh, room there is, or, or maybe how thick the the pipes are that are holding up the platform, so we know how much we could load that, or at least provide the analysis to the engineers so they can determine and do the loading analysis to make sure that you know that system is going to be safe with whatever modifications that are happening. And to do that, traditionally, we would use uh, two climbers. Uh, we you know one one would be on the ground making sure that they're able to do a safety rescue while the other person would secure themselves safely to the tower, climb and take whatever photos or images or um, measurements that they may need. And it would all be done primarily with an iPhone, maybe with a high, uh, a high resolution camera, uh, oftentimes with a notepad and a piece of paper. Um, you know, today, as we look to expand and look at the advantages and some of the efficiencies we can get, you know, now you're talking about possibly not putting somebody up the tower and instead you're looking at a technician or somebody who can operate a UAS may or may not be with the, the you know, within your company, maybe utilizing a third party to do that. And in some cases, you have the ability to get it down to a single person instead of multiple people on that site. Um, you know, in, in, in a climbing type environment, you know, with the rigging and all the safety protocols that go into place and your pre-checklist, you know, it's not unusual to be on site for upwards of a half a half a day, making sure that everything is set and ready to go. And then, you know, the process of climbing, it takes a long time to climb 400 feet. You know, you, it's straight up and uh, it's taxing and dangerous and uh, and really makes you work. But it takes time above all to get up there. We can cover that time much quicker with a UAS and a launch and how quickly we can get up to the level of uh, data that we're looking to collect. So if that data might be on a 400 foot tower, might be at 350 feet, well, we can get there quickly with a drone and, and focus in on the areas that we care about. Plus, um, you know, while each company has got standard operating protocols and procedures in place to collect the data to provide it back to the clients, you know, in many cases, each company might be doing it slightly differently and providing the data in a different format. Utilizing a drone and then utilizing the back office software that goes with it, you can do a much more repeatable process that provides a, a higher consistency of data to the end user so that they, they see things the same way and it speeds up their processes as well. You know, from a health and safety, I mentioned, you know, you, you, know, you got to be in good physical condition to climb. Uh, it, you know, the weather plays a big part of it. You know, it's strenuous um, and it's dangerous. You know, we have lots of safety protocols in place. You know, but at the end of the day, you know, you are elevated and have a person at height. So, you know, ultimate care and safety is always number one. And we take that to heart. So anytime you put an individual uh, at height, a lot of care goes into before you put them in there. And that's time consuming. You know, with the drone, we can limit the amount of people that are that are subject to being uh, in the air and having to, to do those difficult jobs and make sure that data can be collected. Um, one of the other benefits is, is we can take a drone 
get it up into the air. And we can really do almost like a quick inspection of the tower from a safety perspective that maybe we still need to do it for a climbing reason. We need to go up and repair something. So we're not really doing a full tower audit, but we need to do some type of action on there. We could send a drone up and quickly look at the structure and make sure everything looks good at 400 feet, which is where we're going, versus waiting until you got up to that height to notice that there's an issue and then addressing it. So it, it provides us some eyes uh, up close to be able to see what's going on. And then many times when you're collecting that data, like I said, you're using an iPhone or uh, an Android type of device, a, a phone, you might be using a camera. A lot of that is manual data downloads. You're downloading those big pictures and then you're uploading those pictures. And then you're communicating back with the main office through Excel spreadsheets or Word documents. In some cases, handwritten notes where you're trying to explain everything that you came across and saw while you're on that tower. Um, now, with utilizing the drone and some of the softwares out there, you can do that right in real time and it uploads it right into the systems. It's a download automatically right from the drone. You can annotate right in right in the workspace and really be able to automate and streamline the, the image analytics, which in the past was very difficult to do and took uh, other programs and other methods to really get to a uh, a faster back office process. So, you know, from our perspective as the boots in the ground, you know, this is one of the areas where we look at it and say, this can really speed up our process. Yes, it, the visual piece and the piece that everybody sees is out front when you're doing the inspection with the drone. But in reality, so much time is spent on the back office that can be really accelerated with the data and information that's coming from the drone. So uh, with that, I'll hand that back over to you, Sam. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, sorry, Cynthia. No, go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Steve, for that. Um, I, I think what we want to do next is, you know, I, I want to open it up to our panelists to sort of talk through, um, you know, more in depth, really like the impact to the industry. Um, so, Sam? Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, before diving directly into that, I want to talk through a, a little bit of the flip side of what um, Steve has discussed and and really talk about how that presents a, a massive opportunity um, as we get this new technology out in the field because we're operating in such a unique environment in front of uh, you know radio frequencies and uh, very tall assets we are learning things about some of the potential risks um, and the ways to mitigate them in this example you know we we're teaming up with SBA and the telecom industry association to do uh, collision tests and radio frequencies, interference studies to understand how we can more uh, safely operate in these systems. We're also looking at um, some of the workflow limitations, uh, team, like a, a team like Steve's who's out there doing tactile work on a tower may not be able to turn a wrench today. Um, and, and some of the issue identification that he's talking about is conducted at the back office. So there may be some additional truck rolls required, but what we're finding through those uh, those different components is that there are massive opportunities to get a large number of these different uh, crew members out in the field. And to do that, um, we see a lot of opportunity on the policy and administrative side, maybe creating some baseline standards across uh, insurance requirements, operating procedures, depending on the tower owner, the carrier, um, and then even some potential opportunities on the government regulation side of things to help put this uh, technology out in the field at scale. And with that, I'll move along a little bit to some of the uh, more specific opportunities that we see. Um, and this is a, a rough estimate on a, a two-man crew that might be out doing a traditional workflow uh, five days a week and doing some rough calculations across the average size of a US tower these guys go out and might spend 38 miles uh, a year climbing. That's over 200,000 uh, climbing pegs or rungs on a uh, tower ladder. And if we look across how that extrapolates into just time spent doing visual inspections that may be augmented with drones, it could be up to 1,500 hours per technician each year. And with that, um, we start looking at the opportunities that, that drones provide with uh, the combination of flight automation, better better batteries, and then more part 107 technicians out there, we might be able to see um, you know double, triple 
uh, quadruple the amount of work being done on the visual data collection side of things on an annual basis. Um, and then to Steve's point earlier, and this is something that we're seeing consistently as one of the earliest workflows, is just going out and, and checking the, the climb path on a 500 foot tower to know that your climb's not obstructed and you're not gonna have to go off your safety climb. And if so, you can better plan for that and see if there's any damage to the, maybe the top terminator of the safety climb. And then it also puts us in a position where we can go out and inspect a component of the tower that would be very difficult to reach or dangerous to reach as a climber. And that could be uh, the backside of a monopole, it could be the far leg of a self-support, um, and then on the workflow side of things, after that site visit's conducted, and Steve alluded to this, uh, with the way that drones are layering on metadata to each one of these JPEGs, it's creating massive opportunities on the back end to streamline the organization and analysis of this, where we can take that data and organize it the same way that you flew it out in the field and give stakeholders in the back office a, a really easy way to come through that see opportunities, see deficiencies, and address that accordingly. Mark, with as many uh, technicians as you guys have out in the field, have you, do you have any specific thoughts on uh, the efficiency gains or the benefits that you're seeing across all the markets you're working in? Yeah, I really do. And, you know, it varies by area. But one of the first things that we noticed when we got into uh, UAS, we, we we got into it thinking from a quality perspective, because obviously that's what I do. Um, we noticed that right away we had, like you pointed out, such a unique perspective on what we were looking at compared to how we did it before. Um, before we we're on the ground, uh, you know, pointing binoculars or camera or scope up at the tower, trying to figure out exactly what was installed and how it was installed, looking for rust and things like that on the tower. And once we flew a couple sites and we were able to see that we could actually see things from, from the front, from behind, from the side, um, we got such a better overview of our asset and what condition it was in. Uh, the work that was performed, was it done correctly? There, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, I hate to say it, hiding defects from us anymore um, once we got into using the drones. And then from there, um, as the technology has advanced, we can now, uh, before we're going out and making hand drawings of sites, then going back and trying to kick those into AutoCAD and things like that, we could produce real 3D images or 2D um, photogrammetry models um, of the drones where we could take accurate measurements and things like that. So yeah, it was, a, it was a huge impact to the field right off the bat with the drones. And Steve, you touched on it. Did you have anything to add to the infield side of it? Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of things. One is, you know, it is a, it is a, a new tool, I'll say, quote unquote, in our toolbox, and it does enable us to provide a varying level of uh, data to the various clients, depending on what they're looking for, whether it be 3D point cloud modeling or it be a, you know, a standard photograph. Um, it's a great asset, and it's equal and, and capable of doing both with uh, great efficiency. So you can, you, you no longer have to have specific uh, necessarily specifically trained individuals to do certain aspects of the tower inspection or tower assessment. You can use a, a device and able to customize that, the output of that device to, you know, the needs of your of your client, which is um, a unique and uh, an exciting uh, piece, I think, of the drones. I, you know, when we look at this, we're still, while, you know, SBA has really used this a lot, I would say generally in the overall industry, we're in our infancy stages from a growth perspective, I, I see this will continue to take off and improve and and grow in usage um, as we gain more pilots, as we gain, as the technology continues to improve and the back office stuff continues to uh, strengthen as well, because there are just a ton of benefits, you know, some of those shown on here, um, but definitely the ability just to see things from a different perspective. Like Mark said, you know, we went from our technicians climbing and, you know, we look you know, from inside the tower out, you know, now you can quickly get a view from outside in at that height 
uh, instead of relying on a binoculars or something else from the ground. So it really changes the whole perspective of the data that you're able to gather and, and how you leverage and utilize that data. It just opens up a whole new world that didn't exist before. Yeah, and that's actually a, a great segue into the next component. And you both touched on these in some different aspects, but the reality is that we are looking at these towers from a very new vantage point. And we have a couple different ways to do that, obviously. And one of the reasons Red Mountain was so excited to get in the business is that you can give uh, this new perspective to folks in the back office where they can navigate the tower the same way that a climber or a pilot has done out in the field and replicate that exact experience, see what they saw. But then we're also opening up a whole new realm of opportunities when you start looking at post-processing opportunities, turning these into 3D point clouds or, or models or what they're calling a digital twin in the industry um, and the analytics that those can provide where maybe you can get dimensional data that typically was a, a climber in, in, the, in the traditional method. And for the first time ever, we're starting to see a single truck roll creating value for folks across the entire industry. It's no longer just operations and engineering that see the benefits of a mount mapping that can be awesome information for folks on the vendor management side of things, uh, tower leasing. How are you guys um, thinking through how to best leverage different image analytics technologies today? And Mark, I would start with you. Yeah, the analytics has been huge. Um, Historically, our data ended up in little silos. Um, certain departments uh, would collect data and it would stay with them. Now that we are using you know, various softwares to organize this data, um, we can easily share it throughout the entire company. So you know, a member of my team or the operations team goes out and flies that data can immediately be used by you know services operations marketing um, engineering everyone is gaining um, from the data that we're collecting and it's easily shared you know some, sometimes we'll go out and fly these these flights will be 600 to a thousand photographs or more um, and before we'd be dropping these things on you know various uh, drop boxes and things like that. And then we'd have to go through the whole download procedure, put it on your desktop, use up all your computer space. Now, if I wanna show someone like something I've annotated on a tower, I just share a link, they see what I see. Um, it's really been a game changer. And when you're talking here, you know, in the slide about the object recognition, change detection, that's huge from a tower owner's perspective. Um, you know, is there more equipment on there than we're aware of? Um, has a spot that had rust on it, has that grown from this flight to the last flight? Do I need to react to this now? Um, did the person who came out and deinstalled the equipment, did they remove everything they were supposed to remove? There's the use cases for it in our industries is really endless. Yep. And, and Steve, you mentioned. We are very much in the beginning of this. Mark touched on how tower ownership is leveraging the different image data. How is it different on the engineering and field services side of the business? Well, some of the things that we're seeing is just the, the clarity in the data and how quickly you can get it. So we can quickly ensure that a tower is within FAA you know, heights. It's built the way it was designed where you know, or a certain at, uh, piece of equipment is at the particular height of where it's supposed to be. Or in the past, we may have had to do a old fashioned uh, tape measure drop, or maybe shoot a laser to the ground, um, which really is dependent on where you hit on the ground. Now, suddenly you've got, you know, you know exactly from a three dimensional perspective, where the center line of that piece of equipment is located. So we can provide that data uh, extremely accurately and consistent from uh, from tower to tower and from asset to asset on a on a particular tower, which is um, unique and, and much faster than the way we used to be able to do it. So from that perspective, I think it's great. The AI um, on our side also improves because now as I move it to a back office and I'm allowed to do stuff, uh, I can have the systems generate automatically what it is that they're looking at and what models that they're looking at. And as those processes continue to improve, you know, I think it, you'll see faster and faster 
uh, auditing that's on the backside because now you know you're not in the process of looking at a piece of equipment and trying to determine what it is exactly you're going to know it's going to tell you that this is such and such a model uh, type antenna um, and it's also it's easy many times to be able to find a particular issue or zoom in and look at something from multiple different angles where before you might have done a tower climb there's specific images and photos that you needed to capture you made sure you captured those photos occasionally you might capture one or two others that are uh, beyond above and beyond what you needed but now all of a sudden like mark was saying you've got 600 images all done at very different angles and depths and and uh and distances from the tower and above and below you can suddenly now be able to zoom into a particular area look at it from a multitude of different angles like you're there and so that ability to be able to see what's going on real time is is something you couldn't do before before you'd look at it and go boy i wish i had that photo if i could just had this photo i could have you know i would have been able to see what they were looking at but you know i'm gonna have to go off you know some so what somebody wrote because I, I can't get to that particular image or now you can get to pretty much anywhere on that that tower because you've taken so many images and and you've put it into a system that allows you to easily navigate it yeah definitely and i think that's a, a great segue into what we're all excited about long term is what's the impact going to be to the folks after these site visits have been completed obviously and, and mark touched on this that in the past uh, a lot of this data inherently ended up siloed, whether it was a shared drive, an Excel file, um, leveraging tools that maybe weren't designed for this type of data, like a, a Dropbox or a OneDrive to host and analyze thousands of images. Um, Steve, I'm gonna go back to you on this one. When we think about reporting cycles, sharing across your organization, um, and then just really creating a usable database in general, um, how do you see that as a benefit to not only your organization, but also end customers who you're working with out in the field? Um, yeah, well, we can provide multitude of different type of, uh, I'll say, deliverables uh, for our end client. We can provide it like you showed before, a 3D or a 2D, 2D map. We can provide specific images. We can annotate easily within those images. Um, right within the software, the platform, we can provide them a link that says, here, you want to go take a look at it? You can zoom right in and take a look and, and, and see what we were seeing. And we can point out specific issues or challenges, things that may need to be taken care of right away. Other issues that, you know, it, it really doesn't need to be taken care of today. It also enables you to put it into, you know, a, a lot, that database of images that you have in annotations. Now I can look at it from a holistic and I can see the forest instead of just looking at the trees. I can sit there and go, show me all the towers of this particular type that have got or exhibiting this type of issue. And because I've now collected that data systematically, it's housed in a larger system, it's automated, and my nomenclature and the way I identify things is consistent. I can quickly tell you across the United States, I have all the towers we've inspected, here's your issues and here's the percent of time it's showing up and this is where we're seeing it so now you can direct your new construction to address issues that you see that's ending up on a maintainability perspective long term you can address that up front you can have you can identify and train your specific crews that are going out to repair these things of what to be looking for and where to look for them and how to quickly assess that so it's it it changes the game because now it's Yes, it's a back office, I can do that faster, but because I can provide so much more greater depth in the information I'm providing, and I have usable data, now I can change my approach from the way I may have traditionally done a truck roll, for example. I know there's an issue at this tower. Now I can specific, very specifically identify exactly where it is uh, instead of just maybe a generic at the 150 foot level. I can you know, really narrow it down and right into you know the three quarters of an inch, or, you know, eighth of an inch type um, uh, perspective. So it changes, it, it, it's a game changer. It, it is absolutely a game changer. Yeah, and I think from the field service and um, engineering side of the business, the, the enhancement to maybe a traditional workflow in addition to what you guys are already doing becomes pretty obvious. Um, Mark, from SBA side, when you guys are managing, actively managing tens of thousands of towers, 
how are you guys thinking about uh, using this data to better inform the back office, augment workflows, and, and be smarter about day-to-day -day operations? Yeah, it, it definitely does, um, especially when we annotate some of the photos or models with severity levels. Um, that's going to dictate what the guys and uh, ladies that are responsible um, for the upkeep of these towers, when they see that we flag something with a high severity level, they're immediately going to, that's going to go to the top of their schedule. That way, you know, they're not just driving out and visiting sites. They, they're they going out and they're hitting the things that uh, really need to be looked at first. Um, and then also with the back office, we're actually taking this data and we're feeding it into other databases throughout the company. It's not just sitting, you know, just in our UAS program. We're feeding it over to our asset management, um, checking to see if the flight heights like we showed um, with the drones matches what someone did with a tape drop or, you know, measurements that people did manually match up to the accurate measurements of the drone. So um, we're seeing a large impact on how efficient we are with utilizing the drones. And as we roll it out to more and more of the uh, employees at SBA, I think we're just going to see um, that efficiency grow. Definitely. Um, so kind of putting a little bit of a bow on all of this, if we start thinking through um, what the what the industry workflows have looked like in the past and what this is enabling in the future, obviously uh, increased efficiency is going to be a, a big deal. And while 80% may not be uh, the reality for every single tower, I do, we have seen that in the past where a, a two to three hour climb uh, is reduced to you know, half an hour and giving guys the opportunity to deploy to more towers faster and uh, get that data to the back office in, in a quicker format. The information itself, obviously, and this goes back to that new perspective where from a traditional tower climbers workflow, it would be really difficult to get the outside of an antenna to see if there's any damage to that vinyl and, or the backside of a monopole or the far leg of a self-support. This is helping us do that on top of really nuanced workflows like inspecting guy wires themselves. And then you both just touched on this, but the understanding of our assets, not only across a project or a region, but maybe even an entire portfolio, help us be smarter about how we deploy our, our crew members, where they're climbing, and how we make smarter business decisions on a day-to-day. -day. This is especially um, important when we transition from 4G to 5G, understanding where vacancies are, what those opportunities look like, can we propagate a network in an area that needs it. Um, we're starting to see those use cases come up as well. And then, you know, as a somebody who's, you know, all three of us on this call have, have climbed towers in the past and being up there is inherently pretty dangerous. And just being able to help start limiting that as a an aspect of the industry is is something that is going to be unquantifiable as a benefit. And then storing, analyzing, and distributing data is what we're kind of in the throes of right now. Uh, because the data sets are new, the technology we're building around them is showing a lot of promise, but we aren't quite at scale. So the years to come will, I think, show us um, exactly where this could go um, to full portfolio understandings, um, automated tower inspections, on-site uh, hardware, very cool opportunities. Uh, Mark, Steve, do you guys have any other thoughts on the overall benefits? Yeah, I know, I know one that I, maybe we haven't talked about yet that I've noticed a uh, an improvement in is site surveys. You know, if I have a customer who calls and says, hey, I want to put in a new 5G site, um, before, you know, we may have to visit three or four sites in a day and we'll be on the ground, like I said, looking up. With the drone and with the data that we're able to see, we're able to see really exactly what it is we're getting into what's hidden up on top of the tower then when the guys are going to go out and run you know install new equipment run new cables we're able to bid things um in a manner where we have all the information in front of us um there aren't too many surprises or uh i'm not going to say there's going to be none but they're not near as many as there were before as the guys would climb up the tower and go oh i had no idea this was going to be blocking you know my climbing path or 
I had no idea um, that the cables that are on top were in this condition. Um, so it really helps us bid with more confidence and deploy the proper people to do the work um, and buy materials and things like that so we don't get out the site and have to run down to uh, a local supplier to pick up some equipment to address a problem we didn't know was there. So that, that's been a big benefit. And I'll hand it over to Steve and let him input more. No, I agree. I mean, I think we've covered the, uh, you know, a lot of the various benefits. And, and I think uh, additionally, I, I don't think we've uncovered them all yet. I think as we continue to expand and use it, um, and as the technology continues to improve, we're going to see more and more technologies that uh, adapted to the drone that are going to improve, uh, you know, uh, interference mitigation, uh, be able to see RF propagation, be able to just get different information that's available in the towers that today might be done by, a, you know, driving by or driving around on the street. We may be able to do much faster with a with a drone that's in the air and can cover wider areas of uh, of space and, and truly be able to see how things are propagating. But I, I don't think we've seen or even are close to scratching the total surface. Awesome. And we do have an extra slide, but uh, Cynthia, it looks like we do have some questions stacking up. So I would be happy to hand it over to you and we'll be happy to share this slide deck. Yeah, the end. absolutely. There's so much great content there. So thank you guys for sharing all of that. Um, as you said, they, we did have a, a lot of great questions coming through. So we'll still do our best to cover um, as many questions as we can in the, in the 10 minutes that we have to us. Um, one of the first questions, probably a, a easy question is, you know, opening up to you guys, what would you say is the recommended distance for flying a drone near towers uh, during these inspections? Or does it, you know, differ based on the environment and a type of tower that you're flying? Well, I can take this from, uh, this is Steve, I'll go first. Um, I'd say it varies. Uh, first of all, I think that's one of the important things from a safety perspective when you show up and you're doing your risk assessment and you're really looking at the structure, you're looking at the environment that it's around and you're, you, you need to take a very holistic view. So it starts there and then it, it, and it goes then from that to based on what you need, based on the particular uh, image you're trying to collect or the data you're trying to collect. It can be as close as, you know, a couple feet off the tower. It might be a radius of 20 feet away. It also depends on the type of equipment that you're using, the megapixels of the camera and the zoom capabilities. I think it, there's a there's just a variety of aspects that you're you're you got to take into consideration. So I'd say I, I would has, be hesitant to say it's a 15 foot radius, um, but you know I think you know generally that's about the distance 15 20 feet probably for most cases. But it really varies, and that that hazardous risk assessment you do as a pilot before you take off is is critical to identifying how you want to fly that tower or structure. Wonderful, thank you, Steve. Uh, another question we have, and, and maybe Mark, you can take um, kind of a first stab at this. You know, just as a as a large um, tower owner and operator that SBA is, do you find that um, in your industry most tower owners and operators have their own in-house drone operators, or do they use you know more third parties, or is it kind of a, a mixture of both? It's a mixture of both. Um, we obviously do it. Um, in-house that was kind of the decision we made that uh we thought we could probably do it in a manner that was uh more beneficial to us but i know some of the other larger carriers um they don't have pilots so they do uh rely on third parties and there there could be occasions where i didn't have someone available and we do have a list of uh third party providers that are qualified at SBA that we will call on and say, hey, can you go do this or do that? Um, so it, it is a mixture across the industry. Got it, thank you. Um, and then I, I guess going back to, you know, Steve, what, what you were talking about earlier um, for a second, just about, you know, how close, um, you know, you'll fly to, to the towers. Um, could you kind of also share a little bit about one of the other questions we got is uh, just in terms of the recommended drone or, or platform um, that you use for inspecting, you know, telecom towers, you know, are you guys more using larger drones for it? Or if you're flying, you know, as close as 15 to 20 feet from a tower, are you using some of the smaller footprint drones out there? Um, yeah, we've uh, we've had experience and used uh, a variety. Um, you know, the DJI M200 platform is a great 
great uh, platform that allows you to add different types of components that you want to carry in different cameras. But, you know, one of the workhorses for us is the Mavic 2. Um, you know, we did some with the DJI or with the, the Phantom. Um, we do the majority of our stuff. We find that it's a it's a great workhorse. It's 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 very capable. It's it's small in nature. Um, one of the things I do like about it, it's a little bit harder for the pilots to see, but it keeps the flying public from really paying a lot of attention to it. They don't really see them up there, so it doesn't draw a crowd because they can't see it and they can't hear it. Um, and it's got a really solid camera. So for us, that 20, me 20 megapixel camera, I think, is a is a huge component of it. I would, you know, I would, if I'm looking to buy a drone, I'd make sure I've got some method of being able to carry a camera that's got at least a 20 megapixel camera uh, capability on it. Um, but besides that, it's it, it's a little bit of how much function and capability you want in that drone and, and variability and versatility. Do you want to want it all in one? Or do you want to be able to, uh, you know, add a bunch of different components to it? For us, like I said, the, the Mavic 2 is a, it's a great workhorse because our teams, it, it's relatively compact. It fits in the back of the truck easily. It's quick to deploy, um, and it's very reliable. So that's probably the one we use the most. Um, but you know, we've used others, others as well, from the M600s to the, like I said, the M200s and others. Um, they're all equally good platforms. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I mean, we have um, a, a few more questions that are, are kind of uh, related to just an understanding really what it entails to, to carry out these inspections. Um, we, we have another question that I'll open up to our panelists here, which is, you know, assuming that you want to do some automated data collection for visual inspection or 3D modeling, you know, what are some of the flight planning software or workflows that you guys have used that you've seen be successful? I guess I can um, speak to that a little bit. Um, I've tried out probably the vast majority of uh, automated software that's available um, in the industry. Um, obviously, with Sam, we, we, we've done a lot of work with him. Um, a tie over the VI, we've done some work with those guys with the 3D modeling. Um, just various ones that, that we've tried. They all offer something a little bit different. So the one that your company goes with will really be, you know, how you set your program up. Do you want to go full bore into engineering and CAD drawings and things like that? Or is your main concern uh, just collecting information on your towers and getting a, uh, a good idea of what condition everything's in and you want to have, you know, a smaller data set and be able to share it um, around? It really just depends on what your end goal is on which one of the providers you'd want to choose. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, and just for our audience too, um, you know, we, we will also have, uh, after the Q&A slide, we'll also have a slide with all of our contact information on there. So if you did want to reach out to Sam and understand about, um, say for instance, you know, how Red Mountain Scientific Solutions specifically works for, for this kind of a, a scenario, you can certainly do so. Um, one last question, um, you know, for our panelists here, um, you know, if for our, for our audience members, if they are a 107 pilot, um, you know, what specific path would be able to lead them to be able to do tower inspections? I mean, clearly having the right hardware um, and also the right software is a big component of that. But is there anything else that they need to do in order to sort of be able to get into, you know, this specific sort of inspection work? Well, you need to familiarize yourself with the telecom industry. Um, as Sam pointed out in an earlier slide, there is cases where you're going to experience interference. Um, each one of the tower owners is going to have a unique way you need to access their towers. There's going to be um, certain ways you're going to have to get permission to enter, you know, these sites. Um, and we've seen it a lot where people will come out um, new to the tower industry and one of the first things that they're shocked with is price points. So if you become familiar with the tower industry, you're going to understand the price points. You're going to understand where you need to enter this market at. Um, I get shell shocked at least once a week um, with someone with dollar signs in their eyes. <laughs> so understand the industry. Sam, do you want to add a little more since you experienced that yourself kind of entering into it? 
Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that I would touch on is that each um, major carrier or ownership group uh, uses a, a preferred vendor management system. Um, applying through that is step number one. Uh, and, and actually prior to that, I guess, would be understanding the insurance requirements that each one of these um, stakeholders carries, because they can be um, relatively uh, cost prohibitive depending on the size of your organization or how much volume you anticipate doing there. So understanding insurance requirements and then making sure that you understand policies and procedures and expectations as far as site access is concerned um, and check in, check out methods, things like that. Steve, did you have any other thoughts on that one? Yeah, I mean, I would I think you guys are spot on on that. Um, the other thing I'd say that you can do is you can also look to join a you know uh, a company that's out there in the space already. Um, there's lots of them that are providing uh, similar type of capabilities, or you could even look at ones that are, for example, for us, who our primary focus is construction, but then have an arm that does, you know, a little bit different type of technology, and that are that are using that. There's there's definitely companies out there that are looking for trained pilots that have got their 107 and have a have an interest and in, in have and want to take advantage of what's available in the telecom industry because it, it's a unique industry, it's a fun industry, um, and uh, you know one option is to go with some some of the existing companies that are out there already today. Wonderful. Well, we are just about out of time, but thank you so much to our panelists for sharing all those insights with us. Um, you know, as a reminder, this recording will be sent out to everyone that's in attendance, so you will be able to look for that in your inboxes soon. Um, and then, Sam, I believe uh, you'll be able to share some of the slides uh, publicly as well. Uh, is there a specific um, uh, a place that you're going to be sharing these slides? Um, we can go ahead and post that uh, in the chat box in just a moment here. Um, and then uh, in, in terms of our contact information, as I mentioned earlier, um, you can see that on the uh, slide. Yeah. Uh, um, that was so all of our contact information. So please feel free to, to reach out if you do have any specific questions for our panelists today. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be happy to post this on LinkedIn and also uh, redmountainsci.com. Perfect. So you can go ahead and take down uh, Sam McGuire's name right there, stalk him on LinkedIn, and then you'll be able to access the wonderful slides that they went through today. And with that, uh, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, we really look forward to having you guys join us for future events. And you know, feel free to reach out if you have more questions. I know we had a couple that we weren't able to get to today, but um, I'm sure our, our panelists um, and myself will be happy to address those questions. You know, however we can, if you were to to connect with us directly. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your week.